Let's turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. I want to thank Leanne for the incredible communion she gave. And I want to thank Anthony for the incredible contribution talk. If you're visiting with us today, we, we are a Bible church. What does that mean? That means we, we believe in the Bible. We understand that belief is not an intellectual thing, it's an action thing. In fact, if you don't have the action that supports what you believe, biblically, you really don't believe it. So we are a Bible church. We, we are a church that believes not only in what the Word of God says, but we believe in allowing it to make an impact in our life and then doing what it says. Are you with me here? We believe in the evangelization of the nations in this generation. We understand the challenge, but we know with God, all things are possible. And so we will evangelize every single nation in this generation. We believe in discipling one another, getting into each other's lives with the word of God, teaching, encouraging, rebuking, correcting, and training one another to be fully equipped for every good thing in Christ Jesus. We are a discipling church. We want to make impact on one another with the word of God. Are you with me here? We believe in central leadership. We believe at the end of the day, someone's got to say, hey, it is my judgment, Acts chapter 15, that this is the way we're going to go. We, we, we are a church that wants to impact the entire world. And I pray today that you are impacted not only by the Word of God. I pray that you ask yourself, for those of you that believe in the Word of God, what is the Holy Spirit saying to me today? What is the Holy Spirit trying to get me to do? How has the Holy, Holy Spirit impacted me? I've been a sold-out disciple in the kingdom of God going on 20 years now. Actually, no, it is 20 years. In the year of 2020, it's 20 years. And uh, I don't know about you, I was impacted by the wedding last night. It was the wedding of Yuri Zikov and Shamika. And so you had Yuri and Shamika. And so I just entitled the first point, Eureka. Eureka, God found Shamika right there for Yuri. A blending of the both, both of those names. And of course, Eureka is actually found in the Bible in John chapter 1. Uh, it was exactly how the disciples felt when they found God. Eureka, I found God. That could be your feeling today. That this is the very first church that's had a true impact on you in your life. Th th this could be the God you've never worshipped that you get in contact with today. And so before we dig on in, let's go to the word of God. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you so much for today. We pray that your spirit can impact our spirit so that we can do incredible things outside of our, outside of our own natural spirit. We pray, Father, to change all of Europe. We pray, Father, that you open wide the hearts today and you speak to your people. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and find disciples? No. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And the church said, this is what I call the ultimate mic drop moment. Jesus has walked for three years. He's done miracle. He's done miracle. He's told everybody that I can overcome death. I'm going to die. And then I'm going to come back. He goes to the cross. He dies for the sins of mankind. And then he comes back and is like, boom. I told you I'd be back. This is the ultimate mic drop moment. And it was coined, dare we say, by Jesus Christ. You say, well, why is that? 
Jesus didn't want to make an impression on the world. Jesus Christ, right here we see, he wants to impact the world. He wants to make an impact. The title of the lesson is Impact or Impression. Has Jesus made an impact or just an impression? When I think about the Word of God, the Word of God makes impact. The Word of God is, is, is compared to honey in Psalms 119. It wants to, dare we say, sweeten things up in your life. The Word of God is compared to fire in Jeremiah chapter 23. Dare we say, it can burn away some of the th things that really are making an ungodly impact in your life. The Word of God is, is, is called a hammer. You say, I feel like I'm being hammered. No, 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 that's just the Word of God. Trying to hammer away at your character and fashion you and make you something that you can be used noble in this world. The Word of God is compared to a mirror. Sometimes you don't like to see what you look like in the mirror. James chapter 1 teaches us this. The Word of God is, is called a light. Light displaces darkness. Light is attractive. It, it, you're just drawn to the light. That is if you are in love with the light. And yet there are only two religions in the world. The right one and the wrong one. And we believe that, that Jesus is the light of the world. The word of God is compared to a sword in Hebrews chapter 4. Of course when the word of God is compared to a sword, it's not just any old sword, it's the Roman gladius. Because at that time the Roman gladius was known as the sword that conquered the world. And the Bible is compared to the sword that conquered the world because the only way you can really conquer the world is with the word of God. Today, God wants to make an impact on your heart, on your life. This scripture is so incredible because it highlights that Jesus says, I've got all authority. Jesus says, I've got all power. You say, I don't, I, don't, I don't like to share my faith and talk about God. Well, maybe it's because Jesus doesn't have all authority in your life. Right. Maybe he hasn't had an impact. Maybe he's just made an impression on you right there. That's the world we live in. Never get a second chance to make a good impression. What about a good impact? What about making an impact in Europe? Jesus right here in this scripture says, I want to make an impact. I've got all authority. You know, I love the Bible. The Bible is, the, uh, God's the only author that's in love with the reader. God is the only author that loves you before you love him. He's in love with you. Love makes an impact. We saw that last night. And that's the heart of God. He, he loves every single one of you. In fact, the Bible says God is love. His, his holiness is love. His discipline is love. His encouragement is love. But uh-oh, here we go, 21st century. His judgment is love. It's his loving judgment. Because he is the very essence of love. God is not someone who can love. He is the very core of love. He is the only moral backdrop by which you can measure anything. And he wants to make an impact on you. Today. He wants to make an impact, as we see here, on all people, because he says all nations. He says all things. That's the process. And he says, if you do this, I'm with you always. That's a promise. And that's impact. And we know that by Colossians chapter 1 and verse 6, verse 23, they made an impact. They evangelized the nations in their generation. Why? Because in Colossians 1, it says all over the world, the gospel is bearing fruit. In verse 23, it says, every creature under heaven heard. That's pretty awesome. For every creature under heaven to hear the impact of the word of God. You know, it's so incredible when you think about the term impact. When I think about it, I think about the 21 tube stations that will be impacted by our sister Lynette as her face is plastered throughout all of Europe as what a real woman of God looks like. Of course, I think about the impact of last night's wedding. Even this morning, you feel the impact of the word of God on Leanne's heart. The impact 
on Anthony's heart. The impact of the singing. Of course, I really believe that we, we all need heroes. And for me, it was, a, it was a challenge, seeing the impact of one of my, in a secular sense, worldly heroes, seeing Kobe Bryant die. Of course, he is called by nickname, the Black Mamba. You say, well, why the Black Mamba? Well, the Black Mamba is a snake that, that, that attacks, that's aggressive without being provoked. And so as an athlete, he always was going after making an impression on the game, on himself, without having to be provoked to do it. The Black Mamba. The Black Mamba is described as super fast, super intelligent, super shrewd with magical abilities. Some myths say that when a Black Mamba wants to attack you, it bite, if, if it's on a hill, it bites its tail and it rolls down the hill to gain speed and then right before it attacks, it straightens out like an arrow and then it bites. <laughs> That's pretty cranking right there. Exceptional speed. And of course, you, you, you hear it now in the media, the Mamba mentality. And I believe Jesus is the one who had the real Mamba mentality to impact the world, to go after the world. Of course, Kobe, five-time NBA champion, the only guard to play for a team for 20 years. More 40-point games than LeBron or KD. More 50-point games than LeBron, Steph, or KD combined. More 60-point games than LeBron, Michael Jordan combined. Mr. 81, Kobe Bryant, the Black Mamba. I think we need to have a Mamba mentality in the movement. A Mamba mentality. To make an impact that no church has ever made. To score for the Lord and to make more disciples than any church has ever made. I think about our, our, our church in Chicago. John writes, not counting the 34 disciples on the supplemental mission team. Chicago has grown by 11 in January alone. And on Sunday, January 26, 171 Chicago disciples had 344 in attendance and two baptisms right there. We are impacting the world. I love his quote. He says, a man on his knees can see much further than a man on a mountain. See, on your knees, you're in the valley of learning because nothing really grows on a tree, on a, on, a, on a mountaintop. Everything grows in valleys. I love what's going on in Boston. Boston has received an award from the city as the best place of worship in all Boston. Despite the persecution, they're making an impact. I so love what's going on in Kiev. Kip writes, hey, me and Elena met with Pasha and Masha, who placed membership directly from our former fellowship, the International Churches of Christ, two months ago. Very interested, Pasha found Oleg's vlog on the history of God's movement in Russian. After Pasha listened three times, he finally visited the church. Both were immediately impacted by the love. After studying the sold-out movement's five distinguishing core convictions, they joyfully placed membership, got rid of the Henry Crete letter and all the criticism online, and joined the movement. <laughs> Luca DeBeo is now training over there. He, he's a Brazilian who's learning Russian because he wants to get the message on out so all the Russians start rushing into the kingdom of God. <laughs> I love what's going on in San Francisco. They just sent out Salt Lake City Mission Team. They just recorded their first album as a church. The Eagle has landed. I mean, San Francisco is impacting the world. I think about LA. Of course, my son in the faith, Everardo, was appointed as an evangelist in the kingdom of God. This was a young man at the age of 15, sat in a service just like this, being impacted by the word of God. His mother told him, if you join that church, I disown you. His brother said, why you want to join that church? Come sell drugs with me. And yet God used a, not completely balding preacher at that time. I had, a, I had, a, I had, a, I had some hair. Bradley, don't look down at me right there. God used me to impact that young man. 
And to be honest, I was, I was a bit nervous. He called me the day of his baptism. He says, my mom disowns me. My brother is, is into drugs and doing some very dangerous things. Doesn't like the church. What do you think I should do? I said, has Jesus made an impact on you, young man? He goes, he has. I said, you need to know what you need to do, and you need to make a decision. That day he showed up at church, he got baptized. His mom came as well, and she was in tears. Now he's an evangelist in the kingdom of God. In our church in Manila, they started with 315 disciples last year. Now they got 450 sold out disciples. That's about 135, uh, 135 additions just last year, making an impact right there. And of course, I'm still feeling the impact of the Amsterdam in our go service. The Amsterdam International Christian Church that we planted just this year. See, we, we, we have a plan to impact the world. We have a plan. In America, it's called Operation Eagle. We plan to plant Dover, Delaware this year. Minneapolis, Minnesota this year. Salt Lake City this year. Tucson, Arizona, the mission team has already landed. We plan internationally to plant Bagal, Philippines this year. Bahrain, we will plant this year. Brasilia, Congo this year. Crouching Tiger number three this year. Guam this year. Kolkata, India this year. Quito, Ecuador this year. Edinburgh, Scotland this year. We are looking to make an impact. If you want to make an impact, this is the right church. You just want to sit here and help, uh, hope I can entertain you, this is the wrong church. If you're, you're in the church, you, you, you think, well, I don't want to ever be hurt, this is the wrong church. If you're looking for the perfect church, this is the wrong church. See, I love the people that, you know the butterfly Christians, they go down, oh, this church hurt me, this church hurt me, that church hurt me, that church hurt me, that church hurt me. You know, you know what happens when people are in churches? They hurt people. But when you've been impacted by the word of God and it's called forgiveness, you forgive the very people that hurt you. You stay loyal and you have a mamba mentality. Yeah. That's why Leanne shared today. She's been impacted by Jesus Christ. Do you know this woman has been in our church? I'm going to tell you how many times she's complained about anything in our church. In nine years. You know how many times she's complained about anything? That, that's the first time I heard most of that. Yeah. Today. You know how many times she's complained she hasn't been taken out on a date? You know how many times she's complained about the pledge increase? You know how many times she's complained about the Henry Crete letter on, I went online. Well, the Bible says you go looking for evil, you'll find it. You go looking for it, you're going to find it. Is Google your God or Jesus? Have you been impacted by Google or the great I am? You know how many times she's complained? Take a guess. How about never? Okay, I, okay, Mark chapter 1. We got to get over there. We got to get, I, 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 we just, we just got to go, guys. We got to go. I got I to gotta, I gotta preach here. I got to preach to you guys here. Okay. We got to get in Mark here, okay? I had to get you warmed up right there. You guys ready for Mark? Yeah. This, this is the only, of all the Gospels, this is the Gospel with the Mamba mentality right there. This is the one that's aggressive, that's fast, that goes after it. I mean, Mark, he doesn't get into any long genealogy. It's all not about what Jesus said, but about what Jesus did. This is the action Gospel that we're going to be looking at. And this isn't Mark's uh, um, debate. This isn't Mark's discussion, it's Mark's gospel. See, I learned living in London, people like to have a debate, they like to discuss. They don't like the gospel. They don't like a truth that is absolute. But let me tell you something. The truth is absolute. The truth is exclusive. You're arrogant. No, the truth is exclusive. I'm not arrogant. The truth is exclusive. Whether you believe it or not, it's true. Belief has nothing to do with truth. You can believe something, and just because you believe it doesn't make it true. The truth is true whether you believe it or not. You don't have to believe in gravity for it to be true. Oh, I don't believe in gravity. It didn't float away. No, you don't float away. It's true whether you believe it or not. 
And so I'm so glad the Bible can impact even what we believe. If you're here today and you don't believe in God, that's awesome. Jesus can impact what you believe. Jesus can impact what you believe. So you start believing the word of God, which is absolute truth. We need this kind of teaching in the 21st century. That tells us. That's how Mark is. I mean, he just gets right into it. He's super fast paced as he deals with the principles of Jesus. And uh, if, if you're here today, I want to challenge you at the outset to seek after God with all your heart. Um, the world tells you, hey, you're in university. You're too, you're, you're, you're too busy to seek God. Then after uni, you get a job and you get some confidence and you're too independent to seek God. Then after you get really independent, you find that woman in the office or wherever you find her and you, you get married right there and you have a joy. You're too happy to seek after God. Th then you start getting some bills, some finances, council tax, first and last month's rent. Up late, you get too tired to seek after God. And then without warning, your helicopter gets hit and it's too late for you to seek after God. If you're visiting for the first time, I challenge you to seek God. Seek God with all your heart. Sit down with the person that brought you and find out what it means biblically to seek God. Find out what it means biblically to seek God. Mark chapter 1. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you who prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way for the Lord. Of course, that would be John the Baptist. Make straight paths for him. And so John came baptizing. The word actually means baptizer. This is John the baptizer. So it says, John came the baptizer in the desert region, and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore cloth clothing made of camel's hair. Sounds pretty inspirational. Camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. And, his, and this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I. Thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And the church said, Amen. point number one, the impact of sin, the coronavirus within. Isn't the coronavirus impacting the world? Hasn't it put the fear of the coronavirus in everybody? Have you caught yourself here in London having the fear of the coronavirus? Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe some of you that are honest and the rest of you that are being dishonest. Okay, amen. Come on. I have. I had a little cough. I'm like, oh no, do I got the coronavirus? <laughs> oh no, oh no, am I going to die on stage or something? <laughs> Preaching to the wall. Can I die? That's how he went out. The coronavirus took him out. They say the coronavirus is like the common cold. Those are some of the symptoms. Italy has suspended flights because of, I'm just talking about things that have been, Kobe Bryant's impacted the world. My hero. Why are people more in tears about Kobe than Jesus? Because we worship idols. We don't want to worship a God. We know an idol has got problems. But we know God doesn't. So we don't want to worship something perfect. Because it exposes our imperfection. We don't want to know who God is. So we claim, oh, I'm an atheist. No, you're not. The Bible says there's no such thing as an atheist. How can you believe in morality and be atheist? Where do you get your morality from? Uh, stop. Put your hands down. Don't steal from God. Don't you steal from God and say you're moral? That comes from God. God is the beginning of morality. God is the beginning of morality. You can't, you can't, there's no way. You say, I believe I'm an That's fine. We just discussed. Belief has nothing to do with truth. You can believe something that is not true. I used to believe I was humble. I believed it, and then I came to church. I did a Bible study. They go, wow, you're prideful. I go, oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> they go, no, that's a sin to be prideful. I go, oh, no. <laughs> thank God for the word of God. The impact of sin. 
the coronavirus within. Cruise ships are docking. France just confirmed <laughs> their first human-to-human -human connection, transmitting of this disease. And the Bible says right here, people went out to meet John. And it says confessing their sins. You know why they were confessing their sins? Because John was pointing out their sins. We don't want people to point. Doesn't it, doesn't it kind of hurt when people point out your sin? In John, it says, he, he says when you go to the book of John, he goes, Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. You know what we like to do? We like to explain away our sins. Why? Because we don't want someone who has to pay the penalty for our sin. So we explain it away. You're not a murderer. You just have aborted the child. No, the Bible says that's murder. That's what the Bible says. But I believe the coronavirus has been going on since the beginning of time. God just has to use a physical disease to get us to have an understanding of the spiritual disease that's killing people every single day. The spiritual disease called sin. There are good things that happen. Why does God allow all these bad things to happen to good people? You know, we hear it every day. People question the existence of God. No one says, hey, I question the existence of sin. Because we, we, we know sin is alive. We know we sin. We know it. We know the coronavirus within. In Mark chapter 7, verse 20, it says this. He went out. He went on. What comes out of a person doesn't defile them. For it is within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality and theft. Murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, folly. All these evil evils come from inside and defile a person. Isn't that an inspirational verse? Jesus paints a pretty ugly picture of our hearts. And yet when he wrote that in Mark chapter 7, the Pharisees had a misunderstanding of life. They thought things were bad because the government was bad. Things aren't bad just because the government's bad. They thought, well, maybe we're not disciplined. We really need to know the scriptures, be really disciplined enough to stop these evil forces from coming against us. The issue was their sin. It had nothing to do with all these outside forces. It was the inside force. And yet, what does the world tell you? Follow your heart. Follow your heart. What does Jesus say? When you follow your heart, you follow your sin. And that's Satan's message. Come follow me. Jesus says, come follow me, I make you fishermen. Satan says, come follow me, and you can just follow your heart. And yet the Bible says the heart is deceitful and beyond cure. I love this here. Because Jesus says, through John, that people were confessing they're saying, you know, it's really easy to get people together to clap and cheer at a wedding. I noticed that last night. It was not very hard to get people fired up about the wedding. I mean, you had brothers picking Yuri up and bouncing him on the thing. I mean, you, it was like, yay! I mean, I even saw Rebecca Gray dancing. Like a miracle from Jesus. I couldn't believe it. She hates dancing. She, Rebecca was like, and I think she was like doing some moves. I'm like, wow! Kobe has impacted her, because you know, Kobe, you can always find him on the dance floor. And I mean, everybody was going, I mean, I even started going like this. I started doing, I was like, wow! I was like, mm -mm. I was like whoa! What's happening to me? And it's easy to pull people together for a wedding, get them excited, you know? It's easy to pull people together for a football game. Yeah! Pay the money. We mentioned 10, 15 pounds in the church. Silence. You pay 50 pounds for a Twickenham ticket and you'll be out there at Arsenal. You'll take on somebody. Let someone write something nasty about Arsenal online. You'll, you'll, you'll think they're the biggest fool if you're an Arsenal fan. Because Arsenal's the best team, right? Yes. See, look at that. Look at that division right there. Look at that division. Chelsea, Arsenal, everybody. Feel the same way about Jesus. Take a stand for Jesus. Take a stand for Jesus. You know you're in a true church 
when people confess their sin. That's what John is doing right here. You know you're in a true church. Not when you get people together and they can do a good band and they perform and all that. No, when people confess their sin. Let me start. I, I struggle with impure thoughts. Sexual immorality, that was the standard for me. STD, sexually transmitted disease. Three times I got sex, STDs before I become a disciple. Bad, arrogant. Cheated on my taxes, stole from companies. Dishonest. A liar. I was around my black friends, I gotta be real black. Yo, what's up? <laughs> around my Asian friends, I'm like, yeah, really humble, you know. Uh, uh, nice. Yeah, uh, you know. Around my white friends, hey John, how are you? Great, good to see you. <laughs> Things going well, Bill? Great. Fabulous. G. Willikers. <laughs> I just wanted I just wanted to impress people. I just wanted to impress everyone and impact no one. As a disciple, see that's when it really gets challenging. Man, I've, I've struggled. Struggled. Sometimes just looking at Facebook. I go, no, you need to have your face in this book, Michael. Don't you look at Facebook first thing in the morning and let Facebook steal your sovereignty. It's like, wow, man, you, 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 you need to get rid of these digital distractions, Michael. Discipline. I tell you, that master's degree is a challenge. A couple 400-page books, you got to just stay reading, and they're boring, and you're just like, reading. I mean, like, turning the page is like three sets in the gym for me. It's like, it's like doing legs. It's like, oh, page number two. Goodness gracious. I need some water after that page. 335. Oh, I got way more compassion for all the students right now that have done master's degrees. You guys are special people. I don't deserve to be around you. You're incredible. It is hard to be disciplined. What's your sin? If John the Baptist showed up and he did, what is your sin? The impact of sin, the coronavirus, from within. What else did we learn in this text? It says, John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, ate locusts and wild honey. Well, that gives us our second point. I'm sure you guys saw it. Your diet determines your doctrine. I know, I know, touchy subject, I know. You guys can start stoning me right now, it's okay. Um, but it is a subject we got to deal with. Um, it's a subject we got to deal with. You walk out these doors, people have an appetite. You say, for what? Nicotine. You people. Just, I mean, it looks kind of cool to smoke cigarettes too, doesn't it? People kind of look, you know, kind of like, everything's all right. Hey. <laughs> I'm just dying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> gonna be in the ICU any day now. <laughs> Food. Yeah, I had a sad thing happen last week. Cousin died. Just last week, another one. Of course, I found out on Facebook. Just saw the tears in the family. What happened? He died. Why? His diet. And all I can remember is years ago, seeing how much he used to eat. And his diet killed him. His diet killed him. You study this out, the locusts and wild honey. I mean, people, these commentators, they go all over the place. I just like to let the Bible say what the Bible says. It says he ate locusts and wild honey. It doesn't say he ate carob pods. And there's all these different things that go, well, locust doesn't really mean locusts. It may mean beans. It may mean the, and they just go all, try to explain away the Bible and just to obey the Bible. It says locusts and wild honey. <laughs> 
I started studying, I go, wow, locusts and wild honey, that's something that poor people ate. John was a preacher who wanted to associate with the poor people. He wanted to associate with those that didn't have that much. And you don't get indulgent like the Pharisees were. They were very self-indulgent. You don't get indulgent eating, you know, locusts and wild honey. He's got camel hair coat on right there. That's pretty radical. Camel hair coats were used for protecting against the sun, but also insulating with, with, with the cold. Bottom line, you only use a camel hair coat when you're outside. Christianity is an outdoor sport. Amen. It's not an in-house you know, deal. You got to be outside. John was outside preaching the word of God. Yeah. Preaching the word. It's an outdoor sport. Yeah. And his diet right here, I just, I just love the fact that, that you know, he, he, he just, it just says, the Holy Spirit talks about what he ate. And if you really want to get detailed, yes, locusts were a clean food. You can look it up in the Levitical law. John ate clean. How's the eating been going for you? Your diet represents your doctrine. Not only the physical diet, but the spiritual diet. What you allow into your mind. What you allow into your spirit. What you allow into your body. I'm so glad that we are, we are a church that believes that your, your diet can dictate your doctrine. We've got to eat clean. We can't indulge ourselves and then call people to deny themselves. And this is one of those subjects that's, you know, you shouldn't talk about that one on a Sunday morning. But we, we are a church that really believes in the Bible. And I pray today, if, you, if you're someone that struggles in this area, God can impact you. The Bible can impact you. The Bible can impact you so you start to refuse that bad eating. You don't eat those negative words. You don't take that negativity in your spirit. You, you just, you deny it. You don't indulge, you deny it. Right here, it's very clear. Diet determines doctrine. If you want to study out Zechariah, it talks about the false prophets and how they would wear uh, uh, hairs of animals. And so when John comes with camel hair on, what he's saying is, I'm no false prophet. I am the truth. I'm not like the false prophets during Zechariah's day. Of course, it was in Matthew 11, verse 8, where Jesus says, would you go out in the desert to see a man in fine clothing? Those who wear fine clothing are in king's palaces. What'd you go out to see? A prophet. He says, you went out and saw a prophet. You know, what we want to produce is a bunch of prophets and prophetesses that, that, that understand that not only denying themselves fr from a obvious standpoint is, is something we need to do, but we, we need to be a, 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 a it, you need to look like a disciple. Let me just say it. And judging by the yawning and everything, uh oh no, we're going to the heart. I like John right here. Real prophets don't need a Gucci belt. He's got this leather belt. You know, it's just a nice charity shop belt around his waist. He's doing okay. Bottom line, his life was radical. His life was radical. You say diet determines doctrine. Okay, bro, you told me I need to get in physical shape, spiritual shape. What else? Well, how did G what did Jesus eat? I'm, I'm sure you guys know. John chapter 4, 34 says, My food said Jesus is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish the work. Jesus was sustained by baptizing people. Amen. Jesus was sustained by getting in other people's lives and encouraging people. Amen. Doesn't it encourage you when you encourage someone else? Yeah. We had an encouragement contest on Friday night Amen. where the disciples just encouraged. I felt the encouragement through Facebook. Everybody's like, wow. So, and it feels so good to be encouraged. Notice it doesn't say discourage one another daily. You know what's discouraging? Disciples that don't change. Because what that tells you is maybe, maybe, maybe that's okay not to change. You know that story of the invalid, the guy that laid there for 38 years? You know what's worse than 38 years not changing? 39. That's like coming to church and, and never being impacted. Just being invalid. Every single person here can make a disciple. Every single person here can baptize someone. Every person here can do the work 
and be fed. You feel like you're starving? All you need is a baptism. Didn't it feed us an incredible amount of courage, encouragement seeing Felipe baptized last week right there? I mean, David up here on the drums already. He's just going to town. He just got baptized. And he's making an impact. Our goal is 100 this, this year. Last month we had six. That's awesome. But it's, it's February now. And we got to make an impact. What will you do to make an impact? What will you do to be fruitful? Will you fast to be fruitful? Will you sacrifice to be fruitful? You know, it's really hard to have a bad attitude if you pray for an hour a day. It's, it's super challenging to be bitter if you honestly pray for an hour a day. It's really challenging to believe you can't be fruitful if you read the Bible and pray for an hour a day. You read the Bible and you see the people there, you go, man, I didn't, I didn't do that. My goodness. Jeez Louise, David, man, you killed your best friend, man. Took his wife, put him up the front. Okay, Lord, maybe the Lord can use me right there. <laughs> but if you never read the word of God, if this is your quiet time, you know what happens when you don't have quiet times? Quiet reservations. Churches that don't have quiet times have quiet ministries with quiet Bible talks. And they impress the world, but they don't impact the world. We want to make an impact. Diet does determine doctrine. Let's get a steady diet of studying the Bible with people. Amen. Just a steady diet. But the diet. Oh, wow. I had a nice bike today. I had a had a nice phone uh, uh, Bible study. Had a nice, nice little email Bible study. Had a real Bible study with someone. I want to make an impact. And lastly, you can know God without really knowing God. You can know God, but you don't really know God. Verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven. I love the Trinity right here. <laughs> you got God, you got, you, you, you got the Holy Spirit and the word of God all in one. It says a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you I'm well pleased. At once the spirit sent him out into the desert. And he was in the desert 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and the angels attended him. I mean, like, I mean, like Jesus is with the wild animals here. Say, <laughs> so, well, why does Mark put that in there? Because Jesus has power over creation. The wild animals didn't take him out. After John was put in prison, wow. It says, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Well, when you go to John's account, the Bible says that this same group of men, they met Jesus. And when they met him, they, one another, Philip got his brother, he got his brother, got Peter, and they went and they, and they, and they said, Here, here's Jesus. But guess what? That was way down in Judea. And so that was about six months prior to this, this what we're reading. See, they had a chance to know God but they, never, they didn't become disciples. This is the time that Mark writes where they actually knew God and they become true disciples. And so it says in verse 14, after John was put in prison, see you go to John chapter one and you read that text, John hadn't been put in prison yet. So this is after John had been put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of, of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. You heard it six months ago, now it's time for you guys to repent and believe it. You were raised with the Bible. That's fine. Now it's time for you to repent and believe the Bible. Your, your parents taught you this. I've been going to church. I, who cares about church? Do you have a relationship with God? This is what Jesus is saying. He says, repent and believe the good news. And it says, as Jesus walked beside the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. For the second time, he says, come follow me, Jesus said, and I'll make you fishers of men. When they had that personal impact of Jesus, they went, uh-oh. 
a spiritual helicopter just hit my life. It's time for me to die and Jesus to live. It says at once they were fired up to be disciples because they did it at once. It says at once they left their nets and followed him. I, I love this part because it says Jesus walking beside the Sea of Galilee. He doesn't stop. Jesus doesn't stop. He's going like this. Like Jesus, got the fishes. Come follow me. I'll make you fish with the men at once. They left their nets and followed him. <laughs> Does it say he stopped? No. Jesus doesn't stop. He doesn't stop. You know who stops? We do. When do we stop? When Jesus stops making an impact on our life. That, that, that got me. The moment I decide to stop, that's when Jesus stops making an impact in my life. That's when I, I know God, but I don't really know God. They knew him in the beginning. But at this point is when they become true disciples. True disciples. I just got to ask a question. Are you a true disciple? See, you know you're a disciple when you make a disciple. But you're not a disciple until your disciple makes a disciple. That's when you know you're a disciple. When your disciple makes a disciple. Do you love London? Do you love Poland? Do you love Italy? Do you love Germany? Do you love France? Do you love Europe? Do you want to make an impact? Or do you just want to make an impression? Do you want people to be impacted by your life? Or just impressed? I want to challenge you. For those of you that have stopped and ask Jesus to stop. Get going. Get going. It, it is time for us to get going. It is time for us to make disciples. We can make disciples through writing books. Some of you are great writers. What are you waiting for? Have you stopped? We can make disciples through sports. I love our pray and play. We can do pray and football. What are you waiting for? We can make disciples through, through, through social media. I love Leanne. No one told, hey, Leanne, can you go online and start trying to make disciples with your voiceover? No, she says, no, I'm not going to stop. And she went online. We can't stop, church. The world needs us. They need us to be the hope. We are the church to change all of Europe. I don't want to challenge you. Once again, until we start seeing scores up here, I want to challenge you to be personally fruitful. Amen. Personally fruitful. You say, hey, I, I, I've never been fruitful, I've never been baptized. Well, you can be fruitful with yourself. You can get baptized. <laughs> if you come for the first time, you can say, hey, can, can you baptize me? I met some people that I haven't seen here for the very... I, I like you to say after the service, you just say, hey, I, I, I need, I need Jesus' impact. I've not seen an impact at all in Europe. But this church is a bit different. In closing, impact or impression, a poem that sits next to my heart, it's impacted me to continue living that type of life as I'm impacted by the word of God. The tree that never had to fight for sun and sky and air and light that stood out on the open plain, always got its share of rain, never became a forest king but lived and died a scrubby thing. The man who never had to toil to gain and farm his patch of soil, who never had to win his share of sun, sky, light, and air, never became a manly man. He lived and died as he began. Good timber doesn't grow with ease. The stronger wind, the stronger trees. The further sky, the greater length. The more the storm, the more the strength. By sun, by coal, by rain and snow, and trees and men, Good timber grows. Where thickest lies the forest growth. We find the patriarchs of both. They hold counsel to the stars. Broken branches 
show our scars. Of many wins, much strife, this is what it means to be impacted by the Christian life. God bless you.